What's up, freaks? This episode is brought to you by our good friends at River. The last few months have shown us that it's really hard to find a reliable partner in the Bitcoin space that can get you access to Bitcoin, help you purchase Bitcoin, help you mine Bitcoin, and help you send that Bitcoin to cold storage. Third-party dependencies like Prime Trust are security holes. Luckily, with River, they built their whole exchange. They built their infrastructure. They built their wallets. They built their multi-sig cold storage. Their Bitcoin that is held on their exchange is backed one-to-one in that multi-sig cold storage, though they do encourage you to take self-custody of your Bitcoin. Uh, If you DCA, if you dollar cost average, you're not going to pay any fees on those buys. Other exchanges have insane fees and spreads on DCA purchases. You can avoid that using River. Go to river.com slash TFTC, set up that account today, and pick your last Bitcoin partner, the most reliable one. River.com slash TFTC. Enjoy this episode. Alan Farrington. This is... Marty Bent. This is a long time coming. I can't believe it's taken this long. It is a very, very long time coming. I very much appreciate you having me on. Well, I appreciate you coming on. You're coming on in the nature that you are. I mean, this is a pretty big announcement from you for you. You've been working on this behind the scenes for quite some time. Uh, I'm extremely excited to see you get your baby out into the wild and extremely uh, humbled and honored that you are, are joining me on this show to talk about it as you guys launch. So, oh, I mean, very, very much appreciate it. I should say, by the way, I'm glad you gave me an opportunity to right at the start that just like honestly, just how much of an honor it is to be on and, and to, again, you know, as you were saying, to, to use this as the channel that we, we do a pretty significant part of the, the launch announcement. Um, just, just as well, not, not just you, but to everybody behind the scenes at, at TFTC, uh, very, very impressed pressed by the contribution that you guys have all been making and uh very happy that yeah i finally i can in fact be a part of it well thank you and i think the wait will be worth it because what we're going to talk about today what you've built what you're launching uh is very exciting and the, the concept that you're really driving towards with axiom uh really reframing how we should be viewing capital, uh, not only as Bitcoiners, but as a society and thinking about how we, how we build business and wealth for individuals and society at large, uh, is going to be an extremely important framing. So before we jump in to your excellent piece about capital that you wrote, um, let's talk about Axiom, what you've been working on behind the scenes and what, what you're finally launching. Yeah. So right now, uh, we're just a Bitcoin focused venture fund. Uh, the blue sky aim though, is to become something more like a Bitcoin merchant bank. Uh, so we've been doing the venture side for a while, actually, prior to, to this public launch, uh, we have a couple of holdings that uh, I'm sure your audience will be familiar with, um, like voltage, uh, neutron pay. There's a few more. Uh, we've been involved in Wolf from the beginning as well. So that's the the lightning accelerator in New York that's run by NIDIG. Um, we also have a, a, some more investments that we made much more recently, but typically it's up to the companies to, to make those announcements. So I won't steal their thunder, I guess, but um, in the coming weeks or months, I would imagine you'll, you'll hear from them too. Uh, in the longer term, though, uh, we, we, we will definitely want to keep going with the, the venture side because I think that the space definitely needs it. Um, but we also want to broaden the range of financial products that we're offering to Bitcoin companies. So I, d- I don't want to talk about that too much just now or in too much detail, at least just now, because unlike the venture side, uh, we are still in the process of setting it up. Um, but you know, hopefully I can come back on in six months or whatever and, and give more of an update there. But I guess just, just to tease it a little with venture, we're providing capital in the form of dollars for equity. Uh, but basically what if, what if that wasn't the case, right? What if it wasn't dollars? What if it wasn't equity? Uh, what novel properties of Bitcoin lend it to novel types of financing? Uh, which I guess actually leads nicely to this uh, to this first piece that we put out because 
you know, Bitcoin's killer app is fixing the cost of capital, or so I argue. Yeah, I mean, that's one thing that's been completely perturbed over the last 50 years is the cost of capital. <laughs> it is. Yeah. So I guess before we jump into the piece, uh, which is capital in the 21st century and how you're viewing capital on a Bitcoin standard moving forward, maybe to set the stage. Uh, and I think many Bitcoiners have a good understanding of how the cost of capital has been perturbed via the ability of central banks to manipulate interest rates and governments uh, to be able to issue debt via treasuries. But like, yeah, how in your mind has the cost of capital been corrupted in recent decades? Sure. I, I'll try to give as simple an answer to this as possible because I think it's very easy to get lost in jargon and technicalities and, and as a result, completely lose your audience on you know why it's a problem, basically what the bigger picture issue really is. I'd say it's just as simple as with the way the fiat money system works, there is almost always an entirely artificially too much debt and too cheaply issued debt because those in a privileged position to issue it are not born with the real costs of doing so. The real costs are um, socialized effectively. And so the result of this is extremely poor capital allocation and far shorter time horizons over which investments are made and frankly financing is thought about by you know almost everybody involved in financial services is is artificially incentivized to shorten the time horizons over which they uh, need to make whatever decisions is part of their job Yeah, and you, you touch on this in the piece, but really not in the context of explaining how we've corrupted it, but it's like really just pulling that, that using debt to pull future consumption forward to yeah. today. Yeah. And that's actually, it is towards the end of the piece, but I do think it's very interesting to bring up is like bringing that, that capital forward or bringing that consumption forward, excuse me, via debt. Like it has, afforded a lot of growth in terms of we built more houses we've got these laptops mm, these yep, microphones yep. we've got all this app and all that we do have this growth but and that's i think one of the the hard things that bitcoiners have when they're making the argument for bitcoin and the sound money standard people will say look at all we've done on fiat we have teslas we have the internet we have supercomputers in our pockets like what are you talking about like we've had extreme <laughs> growth um uh, but i think you touch on it perfectly in the piece where it's like yes it's true but it's it's really not like as good as it could be or there, there's something is awry here where yeah yes, we yeah we have we have extreme control. growth but at what cost <laughs> that's maybe one yeah. way of of thinking about it we have uh rapidly accelerating revenues of already enormous companies uh, and yet basic infrastructure is literally falling apart. Yeah. Yeah. We got the supercomputer, but our, our railroads are collapsing into rivers. Our highways are collapsing. Yeah. Uh, the, the air fleet. That's another one. We, Matt and I talked about this in Rapid Hole Recap a couple of weeks ago, but like the the airline industry, older fleets, uh, less ex that's actually another thing too, like less expertise like, uh, in terms of pilots. Well, yeah, of yeah. exactly. Yeah, there's no, there's no, I wouldn't say, maybe not, there's zero, but there's artificially diminished incentive to develop the expertise necessary to maintain critical infrastructure because there's a, such a pull into I, I'm overgeneralizing a little bit here, but finance and tech, basically, 
Um, what, one other thing I did want to pick up on just before we, I, I didn't want to move on without having mentioned this is I don't want the audience to understand my argument here as saying that debt is bad in, in kind of absolute terms. It's because you do hear this occasionally in pr- probably more Bitcoin Twitter than the Bitcoin community at large, but you know, on a, on a Bitcoin standard, on any sound money standard, there just won't ever be any debt because the cost of interest will go to zero and, and you know, your upside is capped. And I, I have a lot of sympathy for this argument, something that we, um, or that I go into in the piece and that, you know, we're thinking a lot about in terms of the, the other products that we want to launch in, in due course at Axiom is, well, okay, what mix of financing is actually going to be optimal for companies operating on a Bitcoin standard, but some of that will still have debt-like properties, even if it isn't literally debt. the The problem isn't that you know debt bad, equity good. The problem is debt has a specific risk profile, just like equity does, just like any kind of financing does. But it's artificially, it's almost uniquely artificially distorted by fiat such that we end up with far, far more debt than really anybody wants, I guess, or, or at an aggregate level, anybody has made capital allocation decisions that um, that make that an appropriate choice. I guess in particular, you could say that there's nowhere near enough real savings to support this debt. Uh, that's maybe the easiest way of conceiving why it's potentially going to be a problem. Um, because aside from anything else, uh, a lot of it is supported by a pretty serious malinvestment such that uh, it it actually ends up representing savings for a lot of people, uh, usually by very indirect means, but they will ultimately just collapse because the the financial system as a whole or the capital allocation as a whole has just become so fragile uh, because debt is artificially incentivized. So just to recap there, it's not that debt is unequivocally bad. It's that we have far, far more of it than we ought to and that we would on sound money. Yeah, I mean, driven by the inability to properly price the cost of capital, right? And so mm-hmm. I think diving in, it's like the axiom of capital and defining capital and money from first principles I mean, in your, in your piece you describe capital as a tool what do you mean by that i mean that i i think that's just the simplest way to think about it it's back to a point i made uh one or two questions ago that you can get very technical and you can invoke all kinds of jargon to to make this point or talk about this subject in a, in a more academic way. I just don't think you need to. I think a lot of people, a lot of you know, regular people, let's say, who, who haven't worked professionally in finance will be, um, will be alienated by referring to capital too, too, you know, too much and too freely, because it sounds very abstract. It doesn't, it doesn't sound tangible. It doesn't sound like something you encounter on a day-to-day basis, but you absolutely do. Everybody does. Uh, if you think of it as tools, uh, you realize that capital is everywhere and is an enormous part of, of everybody's life. And, and even we can maybe dig into what I even mean by tools, but, uh, anything that any, any uh, almost item, I guess, if you want it to feel really tangible, um, that enables you to accomplish some task that would otherwise take you much, much more time or cost or energy or however you want to conceive it. Um, so it doesn't need to be, you know, a hammer. Uh, it could be, it could be this microphone. It could be the laptop I'm, you know, doing this podcast on. Um, tools are clearly everywhere, which means capital is clearly everywhere as well. Yeah, and this gets back to like something that we focus a lot on at 1031 and like a Bitcoin, like operating mentally under Bitcoin standard is really sort of recalibrated by brain personally um, and many others to think like when allocating capital, like, all right, what is the, the actual goal? Um, obviously mm-hmm. we've lived under this fiat standard with a lot of debt and uh, a hyper financialization 
of debt and other financial products that has uh, essentially allowed people to to lock in paper profits uh, and pass mm-hmm. them on to somebody else. But in a world in which capital is truly scarce, you can't print the monetary units that give you access to capital. How does this change? What is the goal of allocating capital? What happens when you actually give somebody money? What do you expect them mm. to do in return? I think, again, I'll try to keep it as simple as possible. I like that we've established the framing of, of tools already. I think the main incentive is that it forces you to take more seriously what you are allocating towards in the first place and what productive capacity you are trying to create because you can't be as reliant on just flipping it to somebody else, right? Um, One of the things we go into in the piece is um, this idea of of liquidity, right? Or liquidity and probably more importantly, illiquidity. Uh, the, the ultimate goal of any kind of investment is to create uh, more bet. I use this phrase a lot for just for people who haven't read it, people who have will recognize it, more better and new uh, things in general, but it, in particular tools, right? More tools, better tools, and, and newer tools. And that is how we actually generate more wealth as opposed to you mentioned in in the question marty paper returns we don't want at the end of the day maybe an individual wants a paper return but society at large let's say does not want paper returns we want real returns which can only be generated by real tools and so and and then obviously you know like again a hammer for example is fairly illiquid i don't think you can you you can't monetize a hammer all that quickly it's probably better you try to use it to you know to do something worthwhile to to try to create some value i think that's a helpful framework to think about what the main difference will be in capital allocation that far fewer uh obviously not hammers but you know slightly more abstract instantiations of capital won't be as liquid because there's no need to monetize them because Bitcoin is money and you know we don't need these like de facto savings instruments that are allegedly uh, channels of investment. And therefore, where when you approach real investment, you'll have to think a lot more seriously about what kind of productive capacity you're creating in the first place. Yeah, and that's... So I, I think in a world in which like Bitcoin is money and you're able to just save in Bitcoin, you don't have to focus on <laughs> investing your money to, to be able to retire, hoping that you pick the right stock or the right bond or the right mix of stocks and bonds uh, to accumulate wealth over the, the, the time that you're working, that you can go and retire. Like how does that, that reframe everything? Like getting back to just money oh yeah that's that's an interesting angle too i mean most of the time when i think about this and certainly the way it's framed in the piece is just a reflection of you know what what my job is now what my job has always been in um when i was still working in tradfi is from a capital allocator's point of view but of course we're intermediaries right ultimately uh everything has to come from from savings so that's arguably an even more worthwhile perspective um I think the change is probably even bigger, and I'm I'm a little hesitant to to be too deterministic about exactly how people will behave. Um, I I can imagine though that th- probably the main difference will be that they will seek to invest far more purposefully. Uh, what I mean by that is that. You know, as you point out, they money will actually be useful as a store of wealth. Um, they won't need to LARP into stocks and bonds and whatever other, you know, potentially more exotic, more ridiculous thing just to try to preserve purchasing power. Um, but whatever they, whatever portion of their savings they do deem to be worth risking, um, that will it's almost obvious from the way i've set this up that that will become more scarce 
which will mean that there will be a higher cost on that capital, which will mean that even if it's not them, again, if it's coming to somebody like me, to some intermediary, um, you will have to be a lot more purposeful about how you think about allocating it. Um, and a lot more long-termist as well. I think that's that's probably worth emphasizing because, I don't know, purposeful maybe sounds a bit pretentious in terms of like, oh, I'm suddenly going to start taking my job seriously. Like I wasn't, I wasn't previously, but now it's like, oh, now it's, now I'm being purposeful in what I'm doing. Um, I think the, the, the more obvious way this, this difference is manifested is again, back to the point about liquidity. Like you, people will, or intermediaries in particular, but ultimately anybody who's allocating capital, um, they will have to think more seriously about the the purpose of doing so rather than just flipping it to get liquid and move on to the next thing. Um, your question though was about savers. So just, just to round that off, um, they will, it is maybe interestingly different whether they're doing it themselves now that I think about it. But I, I guess in any case, uh, whatever portion of their savings is being allocated to uh, something that is is embracing risk more than you know basically none at all, which is what savings ought to be. Um, it'll end up being uh, going towards something with a more uh, well thought through, let's say, uh, long term vision of what it's supposed to be creating. I think we'll see, though. I, I who really knows? <laughs> yeah. Well, no, I think intuitively that makes a lot of sense to me and apply it apply to an individual or a company as well because you can view mm -hmm. individual savings as like profits they made from their jobs and paying off their month to month expenses in, in some way for future funding um, in the context of a business it's one thing you, you have this beautiful flow chart in the piece it shows the relationship between a balance sheet and income statement and funding mm. um, to create cash, productive assets, which hopefully create revenue um, and pay off cost. And at the end of the day, uh, you get some profit, which goes back to the funding. And again, really honing in on this long-term ism of, hey, like in a world in which we get a better cost of capital and the goal, like the individual you just said, like a lot of people's goal right now is to make a as much money as possible to go uh, consume, if you will, to go mm -hmm. like, take mm -hmm. on like a bunch of pleasures and hedonistic um, endeavors that, that really aren't fulfilling at the end of the day. And, and that is partly possible, I would imagine, because we've had this era of cheap money and debt where it's a, a mm -hmm. lot easier to consume a lot of fri frivolous things and experiences um, where, where you're trying to frame it here what you guys how you guys view this at axiom and um essentially take a long-term view and really find businesses that are going to actually profit and then reinvest yeah. that profit yeah. to get more productive assets to expand their operations and actually build yeah. sustainable long-term businesses yeah i'm really glad that you ended on that point because i was thinking of that um as when you brought up this flowchart and this overall point about well, how does it affect capital allocation at the, at the level of a company rather than uh, than you know some other financial intermediary, and I think that's maybe even a better example to understand because the the consequence is a lot more immediate, which is that they need to be profitable. <laughs> Basically, they need to have and and the the point that I'm making in that chart it's a little difficult to describe. Maybe you can put it up on the screen or, or you know, do that in post um, for people to have a look at, or, or they can just look at it later. I don't know. Um, there's quite a lot going on in this chart. I'm not going to walk through it, but maybe just, you know, commentary on top of it. What I'm trying to point out here is that in the course of capital cycling through a company, um, which we're visualizing with uh, a balance sheet and an income statement and then feeding into one another as, as time goes on. What really matters is not that they grow their revenue, which is very often just 
if, if people talk about growth in finance, that's typically what they mean. And I have argued elsewhere, but make the point again here that that's borderline nonsensical. Um, it's better to think about uh, the increase in profit. That's certainly more helpful than revenue. Um, but what really matters is returns. And the reason returns matters is that that alone is what allows you to sustainably increase productive assets. And this ties together a bunch of the points we've mentioned so far. Productive assets are tools, right? They're, they're capital, but they're capital made illiquid uh, so that you can create something that's actually valuable. And the, the existence of productive assets at all, right, or the, the structure of incentives that, that even allows for them to come into existence, that's what creates everything else. That's what creates revenue. That's what creates profits. That's what legitimizes the entire enterprise of, of allocating capital. And, you know, there are even being intermediaries who specialize in this. Um, and so I think you're absolutely right to point out that the onus on companies will be to generate as high returns as they can, in part because I, I used kind of an interesting word there, which I think this gets a lot of uh, a lot of flack for its misuse in, in wider finance, which is sustainable, right? It's almost like a, it's like a euphemism for, mm -hmm. uh, for well, it, it is literally one of the, no, no, the S in ESG is, is social, I guess, but it, they're used kind of interchangeably as, you know, bringing up ESG that's, oh, is this sustainable or not? Ultimately, what makes a business sustainable? It's got nothing to do with ESG, it's its returns. And what that is capturing is that they are growing their productive assets. And so if you want to contrast this to, uh, yeah, what we've just become used to in fiat. And also I think why, uh, why what I mentioned before about regular finance saying growth, the, saying the word growth and really meaning just revenues going up, um, it gets around this point about sustainability really well, nicely, I guess, from their point of view, but awfully from our point of view, because revenues could be going up while making a loss and while loading up on debt. Like that could literally be the reason that revenues are going up, that whatever the company is doing is a complete waste of time. Their, their allegedly productive assets are not, in fact, productive as judged by the market, but they keep taking on more and more debt so that they can keep juicing the revenue number and everybody's fine with that because why not why not destroy capital in that way if you're if you are incentivized to uh treat your investments as if their liquidity is the most important thing so you can always just sell out of something like this if um you know if the sentiment turns on it um and if um yeah if, if the 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 existence of the sentiment that is pricing this in the first place, you know, for whatever reason, just doesn't care about returns anyway, you know, doesn't care about returns, doesn't care about profits, doesn't care about productive assets, just cares about growth. It's going to be good when we leave yeah, this that, behind. <laughs> well, I think we're beginning to see the, the repercussions of this, obviously with the fed raising rates uh, as aggressively as they had, and they're not alone. Rates have been raised across the board, the ECB, the BOE, uh, and we're beginning to see the, the products of that, like the, the companies going into a same amount of debt, so like really focusing on revenues instead of actual profits. Uh, once that cost of capital is artificially manipulated higher by mm. the central banks, like the tide comes in, and they've got all this debt. Yes, they may have all this revenue, but the cost uh, of their debts has gone up significantly. They can't pay it off. And as a result, I think Germany has the highest number of bankruptcies it's had in decades. I think we're at 2007 levels here in the U.S. in terms of company bankruptcies. And that's one interesting thing. The companies that have been operating under the fiat standard and in that framework of, yeah, we just raise more debt, juice revenues, and hmm. yeah. that's our, our growth. <laughs> It's not, yeah. it's not actually sustainable. I'm very happy that you define sustainable in that way because Parker Lewis that does the same exact thing. And that's particularly, we talk about a lot about it in the context of Bitcoin mining. It's like people talk about Bitcoin mining 
sustainability in the context of their energy mix. But, oh yeah, yeah that must really be infuriating. Like, I I can see the contrast in that in that domain yeah. for sure. Yeah, the most sustainable miner is the one that can produce Bitcoin at the lowest cost and yeah. lock in profits and reinvest. Like that is what a sustainable miner is. Um, but again, like the, the repercussions of the manipulation of the cost of capital. Like, yeah, it's good when it's working in your favor, but as soon as it turns against your favor, like you're shit out of luck and your inability to focus on an actual sustainable, profitable business mm. model is going to come back and bite you in the ass. There's there's two points I'd make there though that it's uh, it's great for you while it's working in your favor, but it's bad for everybody else because what's ultimately happening. Uh, or maybe I'll refer to that chart again for people who who do have it in front of them, but hopefully this should make sense. Anyway, what's ultimately happening is that um, your allegedly productive assets are being prioritized and what you might think of as actually productive assets somebody else might want to invest in uh, are are being inflated, right? Because it, there's at the end of the day, there is only so much real capital. There's only so much real tools. You can print as much money as we want, but it's just... You know, as um, I'm pretty sure this goes back to safe, or at least I, I heard it from safe. Um, this this framing of it, you know, money's not wealth. Money's just claims on wealth. So the more claims on wealth we have, obviously, the more this, this is inflation, essentially. Right? This is inflation, but in capital goods markets. Um, and so you were saying that, yeah, it's good for you while rates are coming down, while money is being printed more freely. Uh, but it's even then it's bad for everybody else because you're just being artificially subsidized in something that is not, in fact, sustainable. And so, you know, there's this, this, this is a very common sort of Austrian trope. I think to some extent it's coming into to Bitcoin now, too, because we've been through enough cycles and people are starting to realize this. I think, you know, particularly in in mining. But th- when you have when you have a, a bust as opposed to a boom, um that's just that's like a reality check that's like all the prices going back to what they should be it's the boom that's the problem it's not it's not the bust i'm almost i'm i'm kind of tiptoeing towards the i don't know if you're familiar with the lyrics from the the hayek canes rap battle <laughs> does that <laughs> ring a bell yes yeah, yeah. I, I, mean, I, I, I think i actually battle. i think i actually know this so to, just give me a second what is it it's like it's uh the place you should look at isn't the, I do actually know this yet, right? <laughs> the place you should look at isn't the bust. It's the boom that should make you feel leery. That's the thrust of my theory. Capital structure is key. Malinvestment wrecks the economy. There you go. That's the whole podcast. That's Those guys said it way better than I did. Well, no, I mean, it's, I mean, in the mining, it's pronounced. It's exacerbated. And we learned this during the last boom, 2021, mm. like I remember being in the middle of it. Uh, and it was a very, very good lesson for me individually, like uh, about these mining cycles, like whenever mm. things get, get very, the price is running, people are screaming, people are saying we're going to get ASICs at $200 a terahash, like you got to get them now while you can, while they're at 115 bucks a terahash. Um, you have, uh, exotic debt instruments using ASICs as collateral, which in retrospect was um, <laughs> the very bad idea. Uh, but it's true, like in the boom, it just, I mean, it happened all throughout the industry, but in mining, people were buying infrastructure, locking in PPAs at higher prices, mm-hmm. buying ASICs forwards, like nine months out, um, doing those collateralized, those ASIC collateralized loans. Uh, yeah yeah this is this is super interesting because i think you definitely know a lot more about the the intricacies of mining than i do so nothing like this is in that piece although i kind of now wish it was maybe this could be material for something for something in the future but I, i think a really nice way of framing all of this is that uh in mining in particular but we would argue we would hope as well just in anything that that becomes more Bitcoin centric than naturally operates on a, on a Bitcoin standard. Uh, you just can't play these fiat games because, you know, reality will, uh, reality catches up with you 
almost immediately. Um, I, I'm just trying to think of like, I, I don't want to be, I don't want to be too, uh, I don't want to generalize too much about mining because again, I'm not as familiar with the, the economic intricacies as, as I'm sure you are. Maybe you can comment on this afterwards, but I'm just thinking through that mining is, first of all, it's, it clearly forces you to be on a Bitcoin standard because hundred percent of the revenue of miners is, uh, comes in Bitcoin and that's basically unavoidable. Um, it's also obviously cyclical, um, but in quite a, it's a harsh cycle. It might be, you know, the most, the harshest cycle of any, uh, relatively large industry of that kind. And so what I think is quite, what is, what does make quite a nice framing for all of this is that, you know, all those exotic financing instruments you just described, they're basically like, they're, they're pretty fiat, right? So the more, the more fiat your capital structure as a miner, the more likely you, you're just going to get wiped out in, in a way that is actually true or sorry, should actually be true everywhere. Like in, in every industry, in every uh, sub domain of the, of the economy and anywhere where there's any capital structure, where any financing decisions have to be made, but because of fiat, uh, it is, you know, everything is artificially subsidized to, to some or other extent, but mining is like, the canary in the coal mine of what's coming on a Bitcoin standard, because you know you play fiat games, you you win the fiat prize of just almost immediately going bankrupt because there's 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 no bailout, there's no nobody's printing more Bitcoin to save you. No, I, I think that's exactly right. Like I think all the mining operations that I'm involved in, um, debt will be something that is very heavily scrutinized before mm. it's added to any in a balance sheet. Um, yeah. Oh, I can make future. another really great connection here, by the way. So we're going back to, you know, what does the word sustainable actually mean? It definitely doesn't mean, you know, you get a good ESG score. It shouldn't mean you get a good ESG score. Uh, it should mean that you have high returns and dependable returns. And also it's a good link to the comment I made at the start. I, I wanted to clarify that, you know, that I'm not against debt in any absolute sense. I'm just against the artificial proliferation of debt. So a, a pretty obvious, this isn't insightful in any way, this is kind of straightforward, like corporate finance 101, is that debt is a is typically a good idea to the extent that the operations of a business are actually sustainable, right? That they're uh, the, the returns are decent and they're predictable. And basically what you're kind of saying there is that you have very high quality productive assets, right? They're, they're actually generating a profit. It's not speculative. Um, and it's, you know, your service is, is valued or your good or service, whatever it is, is valued enough that you can with some confidence project out into the future. The more that's true, the better an idea debt becomes because you're more robust in the first place to the financing shock that debt is going to attach to your business. Um, but obviously there's a trade-off there, right? It, it lowers your overall cost of capital provided you're, you're in the right shape to take that shock. And it's now just occurring to me how good an example mining is of all of this. Because back to your point about, I think the, what brought this up in the first place, um, what it actually means to be a quote unquote sustainable miner, right? If you're actually a sustainable miner, it really just means that you have the lowest cost of power. Um, there's, I, again, I'll defer to you on, on more intricacies there, but uh, that seems to me would be the most uh, or the best way of, of achieving robustness, you know, low cost of power and predictably low cost of power and predictably low cost of whatever else. Uh, the more you are that, the better an idea debt is. But if you're not, it's a terrible idea. And I think that's what you were saying, that people have finally realized that. Some people have finally realized that. Yeah, and it, it uh, so mine is hyper cyclical, right? And it all comes back to timing. So like, I do agree that debt does make sense. That's why I said like, yeah, if you're gonna add debt to your operation, you're gonna 
heavily scrutinize it. And by that, you're going to try mm. and determine where you are in the mining cycle. Like maybe it does make sense. Like maybe right now or six months ago uh, to go into some debt in the mining industry, even though economics are bad. It's like, all right, we can assume that we're a little bit, uh, we're close to the halving or you're from the halving. Um, uh, I don't think it's going to go much lower. Maybe we go into debt now. Um, to expand operations and increase revenues, hoping that Bitcoin does what we think it's going to do, continues adoption, which naturally drives up price, and then we have all this infrastructure built out um, that is creating profits for us as the price goes up. And then another thing, too, I think another big lesson that's not really spoken about as much that should have been learned last cycle is inventory management. So that's the thing. Like hmm. Essentially what a miner does, they produce Bitcoin, and they have Bitcoin inventory, that sits on their balance sheet and the profit on that inventory is not realized until you sell it to the market, right? And so that's one thing that I think a lot of miners, some of which went bankrupt and are going through bankruptcy proceedings right now, had massive Bitcoin treasuries uh, and did not sell any when Bitcoin hit 60K um, mm. in 2021. Right? They held it or like we're going to accumulate, accumulate, accumulate. Uh, but then they finally relented and their hand was forced and they sold at 20K um, later in 2022. Yeah. So that's another thing too. Like the bottom of the market, maybe it doesn't make a lot of sense to to go into some debt to expand operations to increase revenues and um, basically yeah. set yourself up for the next bull market. And then it's always hard to do as an individual, as a miner, as a company, as a Bitcoiner, Generally, like when we're screaming in a bull market, like I think the inventory management, like you, you produced Bitcoin that's sitting on your balance sheet at a very low cost. Now, the cost of Bitcoin in, in the bull market is 10x that, lock in a 10x. That's, that's when the profit is realized, yeah. when you actually sell it back to the market. So lock that so, in. Let, let me know if you think I'm pushing the reasoning a bit too far here. But I think I have a nice way of explaining even this in terms of some of the concepts that we've covered. So that, I know you're giving a deliberately kind of exaggerated example, although I'm sure there are some companies you're aware of that, that fit that profile more at the, the extreme of the risk spectrum. That's, that clearly represents, to me at least, it, it, it clearly suggests pretty poor uh at least treasury management if not just corporate governance as a whole what i suspect is going on there is that the not even so much the management but the shareholders in these companies probably management counts as a decent chunk of that now that i now that i think about it but you know the shareholder base is viewing this entire enterprise this entire you know channel of capital allocation if you like as a way of uh effectively levering up on on bitcoin that that would be my guess as to why they would make those decisions within that corporate structure even though it's clearly okay obviously hindsight's 2020 but even at the time i i think you would argue it it was a, a at least a very risky idea, like an unnecessarily risky idea uh, and not prudent management of the company or companies. Um, and maybe the the better way for everybody involved to achieve what they actually wanted in all of this would have been to just go buy Bitcoin, right? Because that's they just want Bitcoin exposure. But the fact of there being so much cheap debt gave them this avenue to get levered bitcoin exposure instead but in exactly such a way that the leverage ended up ruining the whole thing do, do, does that like does that ring a bell i just came up with that now but it does uh it doesn't sound too far-fetched as i'm saying it for the first time no not at all i mean people view bitcoin miners as something like uh like a, like a leverage bitcoin play if you will mm. especially if they can produce which is interesting because I don't think um, they should. I don't know if you think they should, but well, maybe that's a bit. No, well, you shouldn't, say, shouldn't say how people well, should to... or shouldn't value things, but it doesn't seem, um, it doesn't seem prudent from their point of view in terms of capital allocation 
and I'd, I'd probably argue too, it's not healthy for the industry at large because it exacerbates the cycle. What the, the idea that Bitcoin miners shouldn't sell at the top because it's like a high. No, no, not, not so much the, the, not the, not the treasury management decisions. I mean, the, the fact that this external incentive exists to, uh, in short, massively lever up into a bull market to mine. Um, and then to tie it back to some of the stuff we've been talking about before that, if capital were priced properly, they wouldn't even have the opportunity to do that. They would just go buy Bitcoin instead. Uh, and then the the swings in the cyclicality of mining would be less extreme as a result. Yeah, no, I completely agree with that. And that, well, this, and it all gets back to like sustainability of the business too <laughs> this is probably so, this podcast is probably like by far the most times you've said sustainability <laughs> or at least yeah, at like, least seriously like not not ironically to make fun of some uh, esg thing no but it said like yes exactly if we're using it in the correct context and with the correct meaning and i'm happy mm. to say sustainable yeah like sustainable yeah. businesses because you think and it is i would argue the responsibility of management being good stewards of the capital to be able to realize and maybe go against some of the shareholders wills who aren't really um, experts in this particular domain mm-hmm. yeah. to lock yeah. in some profits at what can be deemed to be a height because especially if you have some debt in your balance sheet or you want to expand operations you have to dip into your your treasury in the middle of a bear market, like you're gonna have more Bitcoin on your balance sheet at the end of the day. Yeah, it may yeah. stink to do it when the price yeah. is ripping. I think I think we could push this even further, by the way, and like link it to not that we need to jump to exactly this point in the piece, but link to something that uh, that I mentioned right at the end, that the desire to 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 do this process, to go right to the extreme of the risk spectrum in, in capital allocation within a mining company. Uh, and viewing it as a proxy for leveraged Bitcoin exposure rather than a business that ought to be sustainable in its own right. I think it's fair to to argue that that represents a focus, probably not as dumb a focus as I described before in terms of only caring about revenue, but maybe at least only caring about profit. Well, maybe revenue as well. If, you're, if, you're, if your attitude to it is sort of so short-termist that it's like, I want the, you know, I want the amount we mine to be as high as possible because that tends to be how public mining companies are valued. And then I can just dump my position when it, you know, when I have a a satisfactory paper return, you know, something like that versus the healthier attitude, the, the sustainable attitude, which is that it's not, it's certainly not the revenue that matters. It's not even really the profit. It's more the productive assets. You want to grow the productive assets in the business. And obviously in the case of mining, that is very, very closely connected to Bitcoin, the asset. But I would argue that it's not exactly the same thing. What actually matters for a mining business, what what really represents the productive assets, whereas I'd say Bitcoin is effectively just cash to it, or or you know, a, a worst inventory as you're as you're pointing out, given that there is still dollars involved what they should really be caring about is how effective their, um, I just keep saying productive assets, I get how, how effective their productive assets are at generating energy as cheaply as possible. I would argue that that is the healthier way to view what a mining business even is. Bitcoin is the, is the reward for doing that well, but it, that's not exactly the same thing as Bitcoin as the goal. And it's certainly not, you know, if, if you have made that distinction already, then you don't get outrageously levered and, and go bankrupt because you realize that the point is is sustainability. Mm-hmm. And I would add, it's not only driving down the electricity cost as much as possible, it's being cognizant of how efficient each machine can be with the mm-hmm. electricity up available to you at any given point in time. So mm-hmm. 
um, obviously input cost, electricity, we want that as low as possible. But then on top of that, once everything's plugged in, creating uh, dynamic systems that allow you to overclock or underclock to be as mm -hmm. efficient as mm -hmm. possible in terms of profit margin at any given yeah. point in time, depending on where the price and hash rate, overall hash rate of Bitcoin Yeah, is. Which I think you'll agree, right, is a very domain specific articulation of maximizing returns because you're not saying yeah. we need to get as high a hash rate as possible which would be the equivalent of revenue like just maximizing aimlessly maximizing revenue you're acknowledging not just that there are costs but i think more importantly that there are opportunity costs and so this is like this is just a, a great way of i'm so glad that we kind of stumbled into this because i i hadn't thought about this exact way of framing it previously that mining is unavoidably on a bitcoin standard and so all the lessons that uh you you know you could come up with from first principles but now i think luckily a lot of people have had to live through uh that's what's coming for everything and it's good because because it's promoting genuine sustainability is promoting being mindful of cost and opportunity cost uh acting in the world as if capital is in fact scarce um and uh and yeah and and growing the base of actually productive assets and not just paper wealth yeah and it's incredible too because the the positive externalities i mean staying on mining so i love mining it's such a fascinating topic it's a very masochistic industry but um, <laughs> <laughs> it is it is so fascinating but it drives efficiencies everywhere like again mm -hmm. like once you figure out like the underclocking, overclocking um, strategy that you want to employ, you then have to go to your your utility operator, the person giving mm -hmm. you the electricity, and go to them and work out like a special contract. Like, hey, I'm a very unique type of customer for you. Like, I'm going to be ramping up and down depending on the price of Bitcoin and the overall network hash rate. Um, I need you to be flexible for me um, to to allow me to do this so I'm not overpaying for electricity at any given point in time. And so that's driving like business innovations at the utilities level. Mm -hmm. And then for reliability, miners want to have the most uptime as possible, ideally 100% uptime. So that's pushing them to bolster, to invest in productive assets that aren't directly related to producing hashes at a machine or electricity, but making sure all that stuff uh, stays up and running, right? And so like, you, you get your profits and you reinvest in productive assets that ensure that the electricity is going to be delivered in a certain way, on time, at a certain cost, day in and day out. And, and you have people like uh, Riot building gigawatt facilities. Um, mm. We at Standard Bitcoin are going out and taking advantage of excess capacity uh, that exists at substations playing that mm. arbitrage game all throughout Appalachia. And that's helping to, to drive costs down for residential uh, electricity consumers because the utility is able to buy electricity in bulk because the miner is willing to show up yeah. and, yeah. And, and buy or like uh, Or like Sonota, who I listened to that episode. You had those yes. guys on, what, just a couple of weeks ago, I think? Forget exactly when. But again, it's just absolutely fascinating what they're doing. I, not possible without Bitcoin, as far as I can tell. No, well, and that gets actually a good segue into the part of um, capital in the 21st century where you touch on lightning because it changes payments mm -hmm. in many ways. So the way it changes payments and the use case of Sonoda does incredible things for opening up capital for utilities, uh, providers, and, and miners that are engaged with them. Just due to the instant settlement finality that exists. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I mean, all over the place, like uh, n none of this is remotely original on my behalf, but I, I, your audience will certainly by now be more than familiar with, uh, even if it hasn't, this is an interesting uh, caveat, even if it hasn't happened yet or nowhere near fully happened yet, 
all of the opportunities people are discovering as to where uh, flows of capital, to put it as generally as possible, are slow or clunky or just expensive, um, ultimately because of fiat being slow and clunky and expensive, but in ways that people never really think about because uh, there's never one, there's never been an alternative, and two, probably for most people, they're not really familiar with the payment process behind it. So it's just a cost that's, you know, eaten somewhere in the back end, and then they get a higher, you know, energy bill um, or a higher remittance fee or whatever. But they don't, they don't really realize why it is what it is. Um, yeah, that's that's something that's you can imagine, especially from the point of view of somebody involved with a, a venture fund. I guess as you are too, right? That. Uh, that's very exciting to see people discover this and try to fix it. Oh yeah, it's. Uh, I mean, it really leads me to believe that I'm not crazy because there was a time that <laughs> yeah. first, uh, first eight years in Bitcoin, I was like, eh, "Is this so crazy?" And then you see things kind of market, whether it be Sonoda trying to solve the the settlement risks that exist between electricity um, consumers and the people that provide that electricity Vita um, trying to solve problems yeah yeah at the telecom and then you see what lightning labs launched yesterday with the AI yeah. tools yeah and I mean it's enabling lightning particularly enabling these types of payments uh, at prices and speeds that just simply are not possible mm -hmm. uh, in the incumbent system. As yeah. open up. I should I should do a quick Crazy plug enough. by the way because uh, I don't I don't want to pass these thoughts off on my own, but uh, as my own, sorry, fellow uh, fellow Bitcoin venture capitalist uh, Max Webster wrote a like really fascinating piece on this. Not not on the Lightning Lab news that came out yesterday. I think it was a month ago or so that he posted it. Um, but he was probably aware of it, though, because I know that he knows the Lightning Nabs team pretty well. I think if I think it's just called AI. I think it's it's on his blog. If you either find him on Twitter or you Google something like Hive Mind AI, you'll you'll find it pretty quickly. But um, that was that was one of the most interesting things, uh, and interesting bits of Bitcoin content I have read recently. Um, yeah, I mean, you can imagine what the argument is. No, not to not to downplay it because he he goes through it very meticulously. But uh, essentially, that uh, lightning is by far the the most obvious, if not so obvious, as to be the only way to effectively monetize uh, at the very least large language models, uh, but probably uh, probably many alternative forms at AI beyond that, that require some kind of human input for training for one. And also for which there just isn't an obvious way to charge N customers for it other than micropayments. Um, so I wouldn't say any more on that because again, the point of that was to shill his piece, which I encourage everybody to go read. Yeah. The, um, I mean, you're already seeing it, right? Like companies like stack work. Mm-hmm how they're um, using micropayments to pay out humans to do micro tasks to, to feed LLMs. Um, that's been around for a couple of years now. Um, yeah, what Lightning Labs launched yesterday is to make it as easy as possible for developers to implement these Lightning enabled paywalls for these API yep. files. Is going to do massive things. Um, so I think about it like for the bent, I use Midjourney for the thumbnails, and I would love mm. to be able to just use Albi or Collider yeah. Yeah, yeah. extension wallet to just be like, all right, here's here's ten sats or whatever. <laughs> yeah, instead of paying like thirty five bucks a month, whatever I'm paying, like I'd actually yeah like to pay for what I'm consuming. Yeah. Yeah, I mean that's um, just referring back to the piece. I think this is what you had in mind when we when we moved on to this topic, anyway. But right after, uh, towards the end, right after talking about what 
you know, the, I think a better way to conceive of what mining is and how it contributes to capital accumulation. And it gets us, uh, again, this f- phrase I'm trying to like make into a meme, basically, right? Like more newer and cheaper energy. Uh, exactly the same thing with lightning, more newer, cheaper payments. And and now we're we're seeing, or maybe we're only just starting to see what that in turn can enable. Um, which even that you could you could very easily, I think, without it being forced at all, you could frame as yet more capital accumulation, right? Because clearly these tools are incredibly useful. This is kind of as what Max is going into as well. A, a decent part of his piece is sort of anti AI doomerism, um, but they're clearly very very useful productive assets, right? Very useful tools. And part of what Lightning will hopefully be able to do is uh, make them more sustainable, ultimately, right? Like, that's basically what you're saying. If, it, if, if the big question mark is how do you monetize this, you know, it's clearly a useful thing, but, you know, how do you turn it into a business rather than just a toy? Um, that's, uh, if, if part of the answer to that is Lightning, that's incredibly exciting because that, that means that, you know, it, it won't just be the, the capital that has to be put up to create the tools in the first place can then become sustainable. It doesn't have to just be like charity or whatever, or like a bad VC investment, right? It, it can actually become a real business. Yeah, you're not going to be dependent on like Sequoia or Tiger yeah. coming in and just throwing <laughs> Or, or Microsoft to be like, oh, this is cool. Have yeah. $10 billion. Yeah, exactly. And then eventually down the road, gravity comes into play and she's like oh this actually isn't a sustainable business model we've just been yeah. raising venture funds and debt to to try to make this a thing but i mean we see that like, uber still hasn't been profitable maybe one quarter i believe they've been profitable ever. oh wow really um, i yeah I, I, I haven't so, thought yeah. about them in quite a long time it's uh, it's no longer my job to but i didn't realize it was that bad that's <laughs> <laughs> pretty sure i could be wrong but i'm pretty sure that still stands today um yeah uh, and like another part of like building a profitable business is like being a a smooth operator that actually knows how to scale a business number one but scale a team too like how do you view like the idea of burn like how should founders building in bitcoin like think about like how they're actually building their company and building a sustainable um, company. Yes, yeah, like, that's a really, really good question. I don't want it. I don't want my answer to seem like basically I figured this out and you should just come to me for, for wisdom on the topic. I don't think that's the case at all. I think probably a lot of founders know the answer far, far better than I do. I, certainly, I would hope so in the case of their own business rather than just in general. I think maybe a more interesting comment that I can make, though, is that um, if you are building in Bitcoin in the first place, you should be cognizant of exactly the dynamics that we just went through in mining. Because like I said, uh, I, maybe more like I hope, this is coming for everything, right? This merciless punishment of poor capital allocation uh will eventually if if we're even remotely right this will eventually arrive in every domain uh, to the extent that they're that they themselves have transitioned to a bitcoin standard and so that's kind of that's by definition true in the cases you're talking about because if you're building a, a business in bitcoin then that's that surely is largely true from the start so I, maybe I can frame the answer more in terms of advice that don't be fooled by what has emanated from Silicon Valley and to, I think to some extent seeped into the, the culture beyond just finance and beyond just tech that you know you have to, again, quote unquote, grow by which the people saying that actually mean increase revenue. You have to grow at all costs because there will always be more venture money if you're doing so. Yeah, that was, you know, like you were saying, that was true when rates were going down forever, when, when basically there was a far more, there was a far larger and more important 
macro play at work that these people were benefiting from entirely without realizing, right? They're just thinking that actually everything they were doing was a result of their own genius when it's really just bond markets <laughs> um, to channel to channel Greg Foss a little bit. Uh, I'm sure every Bitcoin founder, probably, again, everybody e- even tangentially involved in, in tech or finance professionally over the past five or 10 years will be aware of these memes. Uh, my advice is reject them. Um, focus as much as you can on sustainability, on, on creating genuinely productive assets maybe not exactly not as quickly as you can but as purposefully as you can uh because costs are real opportunity costs are real no one's printing bitcoin to bail you out um there will not be an endless wave of vc money to also bail you out that's that's probably i'm comfortable saying that i'm not comfortable uh giving entirely generic advice as to like how, how you should manage burn that'll vary from one company to another but the more the more the founders and the operators can reject this now somewhat annoyingly culturally ingrained meme the better yeah and i think i mean two great examples of companies that have gone slow done it the right way uh, disclaimer with both 1031 portfolio companies, but I think considering everything that's going on in the last year specifically, Unchained and River, uh, mm-hmm. I mean, River, mm-hmm. yep. the last month alone with the Prime Trust blow up, uh, it has become very apparent to, to the market and very clear that their decision to build their own infrastructure, build their yep. own exchange, yep. build their own wallets, their own lightning um libraries like yes it took them a long time to do that but it turned out to be the right decision yeah they, they <laughs> well that's the thing right know. again I'm, I'm more or less quoting from the towards the end of the piece but creating real capital does take a long time <laughs> like you uh <laughs> yeah. um you're not going to expect anything uh anything worthwhile to have happened in in three months so i know all these pub uh, all these um companies sorry aren't public anyway but again there's kind of a there's a similar element more from from finance and from tech around you know quarterly earnings and like pumping the numbers and so on uh hypothetically if river had been a public company they would have been absolutely destroyed for that decision (laughs) like what on earth are you doing your your quarterly numbers are shit like everything's in the red what's wrong with you how dare you construct productive assets (laughs) How, how dare you build tools just just give us revenue, you know? So no, good for them. Good for Alex. I like him a lot. Yeah, no, but it, I mean, and it goes to like that long-term view, like having the vision and the confidence to make a call. Like, Hey, I don't think um, many people being dependent on third party custodians like prime trust is the right way. I think eventually yeah. the market will realize yeah. this. And if we build something when the market does realize that they will come to us. Similarly, with Unchain and their lending desk, with the, the multi-sig collaborative custody and the 40% LTV, the, the crazy over-collateralization thing, they watch block buy Celsius and everybody blow up. Mm-hmm. Um, the decisions they made, people coming to them now, similar thing. Like, yep. hey, yeah. I think that's an extremely way to run uh, a lending business. Uh, if we build this the right way, eventually over time, the market will realize um, but yeah. in these high time preference fiat times, it's very contrarian view and hard view <laughs> to take. Because, yeah. like you said, you could be sitting there, especially if they were publicly traded companies, where the quarterly isms that exist in our world, unfortunately, just don't allow people, the general public and analysts, to, to actually take a long term view on anything anymore. Yeah, and, and a great contrast to uh, to what we already described with mining, right? That um, you know, whoever Celsius, BlockFi, everybody else, I've probably forgotten who most of them even were by now. Um, but they, they didn't. I guess they didn't exactly get levered up, but it, they kind of, they did the equivalent in slightly more, um, slightly more convoluted ways. Whereas Unchained was 
deliberately, very purposefully, as I understand it, robust, right? They, they have not just, you know, a coincidentally robust balance sheet, but the, the entire, the point of that business, again, as I understand it, I don't have any involvement with them. Um, but the point of that business is to, to build robustness into how they operate and how they nudge their customers to operate as well. Whereas everybody they're now replacing who had, you know, again, amazing revenue growth for a time, for a couple of quarters there, they were, they were doing, they were doing pretty well, but, uh, obviously they, in, in, in reality, they weren't at all. And, and even that, that's maybe back to like, it flushes out in the bust, but the, the damage was all done in the boom. Yep. Yeah. And like, how do you have the temperance during the boom? I think that's the one thing that 2021 was really shocked because that's my third cycle, third bull cycle, I guess. It was like 2013, 2014, 2017, yeah, 2021. And the first two for me, it was like learning, all right, shit coins are nothing. Like, <laughs> they may have like a good pitch and get very like, confused a lot of people. In like 2016, 2017, I was like, all right, Bitcoin only. Let's lean into that. And then this last cycle, it's really been like, all right, this is the third cycle. We start to have pattern recognition come in. <laughs> yeah. How, how, do you, how do you avoid? I think I'm I'm one cycle behind you in terms of my, uh, my involvement in the space. But uh, I'm curious your take on this. Are, are you not? I feel like I'm here already, so I'm amazed that maybe if you have the patience not to be, but like, how do people not get it yet? <laughs> like, how many more, how many more iterations of this do we need? Or is it different? Maybe it's different people every time. That's that's maybe that's like a less cynical view. I don't know, the um, this cycle, I mean, 2015, 2016, I was like, like coming out of that bear market it was right after Ethereum launched, so like there's a lot of hype around that and then obviously in 2017 the ICOs then you had this DeFi mm -hmm. stuff in 2020 and 2021 but as it stands today like I'm not seeing any I don't know I could be wrong maybe I'm not paying enough attention to it but I'm not seeing like any hype comparable to those two cycles from the all oh, just you wait just... I know I mean ordinal having and what is it, what is it like, like 10 months away now 10 months. Yes. So, uh, yeah, yeah. Just, you have no idea what fresh hell awaits. Right. But what could they do? What else could they do? <laughs> I mean, the big meme I'm seeing like wall street run with is like tokenized financial assets, like stocks and stuff. It's completely boring. Um, is that going to be a, a crypto thing? I mean, what do you, what do you do after DeFi? Well, I guess where, where I was going with that was how do you shove printing tokens into that? I don't, I don't really see it. It's a bit tangential to this. I don't know how, how deep you want to go in it. It's certainly, it's not something we talk about in the, in the piece, but I'm actually relatively bullish on, on tokenizing financial assets, but that's entirely like downstream of the, the block stream connection. I think I'm the, I, I said this in the, the BlackRock ETF piece, which I know that you, I know you read. Um, I said it in an entirely sarcastic way right at the start, but I'm like the only public liquid bull that I'm aware of. So I, I actually like that idea, <laughs> but, um, but I think if anything, that's kind of, that's why I'm, uh, reflexively against it becoming a crypto thing. Cause I'm like, no, but that actually makes sense. Like they never do anything that makes sense. Like there's no, there's no scam there. That's a good idea. <laughs> Exactly. Well, that's the thing. Like, no, they can't make money from it. You're just literally yeah. um, creating provenance for these securities on like a liquid token, but like they're still going to have idea. Like once they're launched, they would trade similar to how they would on the stock market now. Like people would read mm. quarterly reports and look at balance sheets and income statements and try to value that stock represented by a token correctly. It's not going to be. It's boring. Trading shit. I'm well aware of that. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. 
Um, and actually, I, I'd love to talk to you about this. I've been saying in a rabbit hole recap for months and to others, like I love Liquid too. I think it's a really great product. I just think they launched it too early. Um, like oh, Liquid yeah, 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 no, no. I have, I have a lot of sympathy for that. I, I'm not sure I would say, I'm not disagreeing with you. I, I, it's more just, I, I don't think I have a view at all on the timing of the launch. Um, I, if anything, I almost feel like not really qualified to comment on that. Because I, I mean, aside from anything else, if you've, if you've built it, you, what, you're just going to sit on it secretly for like five years or whatever. I, I don't know. I, I don't, I, I had no connection or involvement with Blockstream until many, many years after um, even it was launched, never mind the, the, the design and building process and so on. But uh, I, if you tweaked that claim slightly, I would absolutely agree with it, which is that it's, best use case even now doesn't really exist and it certainly didn't when it was launched so again i'm not quite confident to to come right out and say oh they made a mistake launching it when they did um but hypothetically yeah i don't know had they had they launched it today it would be a lot more obvious what it was for i think i think part of it too this is a little tricky because again i wasn't involved when this was happening so i'm this is very much second hand but my impression is that the original pitch not for the entire project but more for like okay well how should you use it right now was for transferring between exchanges so both um both LBTC and the, uh, is, it, is it called the USDT? I forget, that. but the Tether on Liquid, which are obviously yeah. the, the two primary assets that, that trade there. And the original proposition, or the, what they tried to make the proposition, what they were sort of pushing to market was, you know, everybody involved in, uh, in crypto trading. Uh, this is a far... You should integrate this into your trading process because one, you can get confidential transactions, so that stops people front running you. Uh, you get far faster confirmation times on chain. I realize with Liquid on chain is a little bit iffy; it doesn't mean quite the same thing as it does with with real Bitcoin. Um, but insofar as you trust the federation, then uh, the, you, you can you can kind of think of them as interchangeable, I guess. But that those characteristics would make arbitraging between exchanges. Uh, a lot more attractive and my understanding of what happened was basically that uh, while that in theory could be done it was easier and also far far better marketed to just use you know something like ethereum or eventually even solana for this Um, and so it was kind of a weak uh, even potential use case never mind you know, real one. It was just like the best thing they could think of at the time, given that the the two like significant novelties of it were confidential transactions and asset issuance. And I, I think how they arrived at this was like, okay, well, how can we how can we like plug these into something that does actually exist now? Even though I'm pretty sure they they did know at the time or did at least think at the time. Uh, more or less the view that I have now, which is that the optimal use case for it is tokenized securities. And so you can see why both that well, you need asset issuance for that to even be possible, but even confidential transactions, you know, it's, it, I would argue it's, it's far more important that you not be front run in like a legitimate capital market, like a, like a trillion dollar capitalization capital market rather than, um, trading in and out of shit coins. So, uh, yeah, I went on for a while there. I don't know if you want to pick up on any of that. No, I, I agree. Um, with that original use case and then, yeah, I've, I always thought like if Liquid, and I'm not saying they launched at the wrong time, or maybe I am with the, the if they launched like this year or next year, I think. <laughs> It would, yeah, uh, it would have been better had they launched like right now, yeah. for example, for sure. Yeah. The, the one other thing yeah. I'd say, though, just because this does, I, I, it comes up enough on Twitter that I've kind of made a joke out of it where I'm like, I'm the only person who even likes this as far as I can tell, is that I think part of the poor marketing around it um, and 
certainly something that wasn't helped by exactly that use case of oh no we want to get this involved in um in in trading because that sort of makes it seem like even though i don't think that they ever articulated exactly this way but it's not that far off like if somebody did come back with this you couldn't really argue with it that that seems like it's for scaling right like you think back at everything i described as like why this potentially would be useful to integrate in a trading setup between exchanges you're basically saying that uh for this use case it's better than doing it on chain um and hence that's that's like almost the definition of well minus some much much more important technical criteria from a use case perspective that's kind of what people mean when they say scaling solutions um i think that was probably the biggest mistake of all because that that seems to have stuck and seems to be a reason people dislike it that i think is kind of irrelevant and um, the reason that i think that it's particularly suitable that basically it's maybe it's only use case but certainly it's best use case is tokenized securities is that you have to first of all you this is true for any scaling mechanism but you have to acknowledge the trust trade-offs at least otherwise you're just delusional um i probably go further and say that in most cases you should lean into whatever the trust trade-offs are so that you're not blindsided down the line and in this particular case there's obviously a huge amount of trust with the the way the federation works but what i see is quite nice is that there's significantly more trust than that in any legitimate security so actually you're you know if you're if you're willing to enter into that trust relationship you should almost by definition be willing to enter into the liquid trust relationship and so you're just inheriting all the superior features of a, a system in which the title to an asset can be transferred um and you shouldn't really care about you know the how, the how the federation multi-sig works for example whereas if you um to go completely to the other end of the the spectrum if you're comparing it to like lightning as a as a, a way of scaling bitcoin i think that's just insane uh, you, you shouldn't you shouldn't do that it's just obviously it's obviously inappropriate and you're you're doing the exact opposite of what i described not only are you not leaning into the trust trade-offs you're just ignoring them <laughs> you're just you're just being delusional about what they even are in the first place so that that's how i think i've ended up in this position of you know the self-described only public liquid bull um that i find that use case interesting and i think the wider perception about what it's even for is almost entirely wrong yeah i would agree with that characterization i think that <laughs> distinction is really important like it's not a scaling solution like lightning it's another thing in and of itself mm -hmm. um, issue yeah yeah liquid man <laughs> it's gonna have its day it's gonna have its day I'm it sure hope it. so it's gonna have its day the uh well, this piece is incredible. Is it available to everybody now? Or is this only going out? It should be. Yeah, yeah, no. By the time this comes out, that is very much the intention. Yeah. All right. Because it's very. It's. A, I, I must commend you. It's one of the shorter pieces that you've ever written. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> well, you got to keep in mind, right? That this is. Um, this is. This is the first of hopefully many. I should add. Uh, sort of a official content from the from the business um i did mention that at the start by the way it's obviously not as important in terms of what we want the business to be it's it's more of a branding thing i guess and a commercial thing but that is quite a big part of of what we want to do we want to have not not too often or not so often that we set a pace we can't keep but a fairly regular cadence of releasing this kind of content um, and so we have we have a few in the pipeline actually uh, that I'm really excited about. What some of them I don't want to put too much pressure on the authors because uh, most of them aren't aren't finished yet. They've just been kind of chugging along in the background for um, until we decided to do the announcement. But one that is 
nearly done and and should follow not too long after this one uh i'm so happy that um that we we that i talked these people into it that we <laughs> that we were able to do this at all so it's uh drew bansal and ryan gentry um from unchained and lightning labs both of which we have mentioned earlier in the podcast uh they gave what what i still think is probably the best talk about bitcoin that i've ever seen and i and I, I completely mean that. I'm not just, I've, I've said that publicly before anyway. So, you know, they will know that I'm not just saying it now. Uh, Miami 2021. I encourage people to go watch this, by the way. It's obviously 15 minutes, 20 minutes, something like that. I, I think the talk is called the Bitcoin stack. Um, and it's it's basically like, it's like a first principles argument as to why in order to do anything that, crypto at large allegedly wants to do uh you would need to start with money anyway and therefore you should start with bitcoin and that crypto in the most charitable possible conception you know it's very kind of technically focused they, they don't call anybody a scammer or anything like that um in the most charitable interpretation of you know okay assume everybody involved in this you know really is trying to build something worthwhile uh which i i think is true for the most part i think actually most people um most people who do work in in crypto certainly as developers do have that attitude um ryan and drew's point is that the the reason they should consider bitcoin at least from that starting point um you know assuming that it's not like oh number go up or whatever is that actually whatever their technical goals are uh they'll be far more likely to be able to achieve them um, if they, if they have this, you know, if they have the right framework around how all this stuff should work. So amazing talk, highly encourage everybody to go listen to it. Like right now, don't wait for our piece. Um, but what I am very happy I was able to talk both of them into doing is just turning that into something written as well. Uh, in part, because even I, I said this to them, like, I, I don't know, a year and a half ago or so that it just should exist as a written piece as well. There, not that there's anything wrong with the talk. Obviously, I've already said how much I love the talk, but it would, I think, be even more useful if it if it existed in written form um, as well. It just opens up even more uh, distribution and, and a higher potential audience, I think. But the other really interesting thing is that just given the delay since they gave that talk, a lot of the things that they said have, if not literally completely come true, um, are a lot more obviously true than even they were at the time. So it's not just this this piece that we're intending to put out not too long after this one. Uh, it's not just a transcription of that talk. I mean, that doesn't work in part because, you know, obviously people, you have to write differently than how you speak. Uh, but it's also kind of an update as well. So there's, there's some stuff that they said about, uh, like Lightning in particular, that is now way further along. It, 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 as in, in real life, it's way further along than what they they said at the time in the talk. Um, but even some of the stuff they said kind of foreshadows Noster. I wouldn't say it predicts it. I don't think even they would, you know, claim that they, they, they had exactly that foresight. But I think people, if people go back and watch the talk now, it, it won't at all be difficult to read into it that something like Noster probably will appear before too long. And so obviously we've incorporated that into the new version. So I'm very excited about that. That'll be coming out not too long after. And then, yeah, there's a few more, which like I said, I won't, I won't shell quite yet. But then again, that's kind of the whole point of, um, you know, the, the social media presence that we want to have is, is pretty much exclusively to shill this stuff when it becomes available. Oh, yeah. No, I mean, I completely agree. That talk was incredible. Ryan and Drew think about this space mm. like on a completely different level. I mean, Drew bringing his physicist mind to the space with HODL waves, uh, center of hash, <laughs> Bitcoin yeah. space, and then, uh, his recent talk at Bitcoin 2023 about Bitcoin and AI. I think his ideas. Oh yeah, Bitcoin yeah, that was AI. that was excellent yeah. too. Yeah, it's uh, yeah excited to see that piece and I agree i think we're seeing it in real time right now this is like one thing that i believe strongly you know, i've written about for years and partly because of the way drew and ryan sort of framed it in that conversation is like the the world that crypto wants of web 3.0 
with all these distributed decentralized applications on blockchains like never made sense like you just need to take open source money leverage the open source money protocol mm -hmm. of bitcoin and inject it into every other open source mm -hmm. content media asset yep. distribution protocol out there like whether it be Noster, http sip boip uh what else is there um podcasting so rss feeds mm -hmm. like to get it into all of that stuff. That is Web 3.0, all these things. <laughs> so basically, exist. I'm just trying to think who, who we have already mentioned on this podcast. Uh, Albi, Vida, <laughs> uh, Lightning Labs, I guess, too. Yeah. But, I mean, people are yeah. acting it out, right? That's like, that's maybe a good way of tying it all together. This is, you know, it started off just as ideas. Uh, the presence of a Bitcoin standard enables people to channel that into productive assets. What's happening? What's happening? Well, can't believe it took us this long to do it, but I'm sort of happy it did because we had a lot of really cool things to actually talk about. Um, yeah, I'm going to need to watch exciting. it back, by the way, because I want to turn all this mining stuff into like maybe you can do you can do a guest uh, a guest post for us. You know, we'll get the the Bitcoin stack one. We'll get one of the other two or three that we have in the pipeline, and then it can be Marty Bent. Uh, I don't know what we'll call it. So it will have the word mining and the word capital <laughs> as seen on TFTC. Yeah. Yeah. Mining is the, uh, mining is the most masochistic part of the <laughs> yeah. economy. No, it's, there's so much going on. Right? I, I don't know about you, but to me, this is the most exciting time that's ever been in Bitcoin. And maybe it's like the Chinese proverb or every, every moment in time is like the most chaotic or exciting time. But yeah. Truly when it comes to the building that's going on, the maturity of the lightning network, the maturity of the mining industry, the, mm. um, the emergence of Noster and people really creating creative solutions there. Um, things like mini script coming to market, the lessons mm -hmm. learned mm -hmm. in the last two years and how to do, um, like Bitcoin financial products the correct way. Like, Got a lot of not only we learned a lot of lessons the last two years not only is the tech um reached like a point of maturation where you can build really cool stuff but i feel like there's enough people that have been in the industry long enough that have had gone through the cycles and had the pattern recognition now to them be like all right here's what we need to build here's how we yeah. need to use our capital. Yeah, no, no, I mean, I, I, I completely agree. I can even tie that to kind of uh, partly, a, I guess, a personal anecdote, but that relates to, to the business, to Axiom as well. That So I was, you were mentioning before how many cycles you'd been through. I'm a, a little newer to the to the space than you are. I'd say I, I was kind of interested in the space, but in no way public from around 20, maybe 2015, 2016 only started to get involved publicly in 2019. Uh, but that entire time was working in TradFi. And it was only in 2021 when in my previous role, we uh, we made the investments in Blockstream and then in Lightning Labs. For me, doing that, or at least doing the work that led up to that, was kind of the excuse I'd been looking for to just dive a little deeper on the... Because my, my job was, you know, on paper at least, it was... Uh, public equities analyst. So I had nothing to do with this, but I was, as I guess won't be any surprise whatsoever, I was like the resident Bitcoin nut. Um, Lightning Labs and Blockstream was the excuse to get more stock in. And basically once I did, there was, there was two things that struck me. So one was just how much activity there was, um, but like legitimate business activity. I think this was the interesting thing because being on, you know, on Bitcoin Twitter, <laughs> I guess, you, you always have a sense that there's a bit of a buzz about, oh, people are doing this, people are doing this. But I had never quite appreciated how much of it was uh, was manifesting as real businesses. Um, I'm not sure that's even a timing thing, or, or rather the timing is more about me rather than about any of them. It's like once I had the the opportunity to look, I was very excited by by what I saw. But then the other interesting thing too is that it touches on a whole bunch of things that we've talked about just now is it wasn't just, you know, oh, I'm now aware that these businesses exist. It was 
given what my job actually was, it was a bit more involved in that is, you know, thinking about how they work as businesses, you know, and ultimately would they or wouldn't they be good investments? And that was what got the ball rolling on. They're going to need a different kind of financing. Not not radically different, because obviously in that position, what what we were even talking about was dollar venture finance. And as Axiom stands today or when this is released, that, that still is all we're talking about. But the picture was starting to form that, you know, on a Bitcoin standard, things are going to be different. Uh, that was also... That was very exciting. That was probably, I'd actually say, was was more exciting, at least for me, because uh, that more more strongly led to you know to where to where I am now to making the decision to to want to do this. Yeah, and we're not going to wait many years to have you on again because uh, <laughs> talking about I hope not. Yeah, the other side of Axiom when we're allowed to talk about it is something I really want to dive into. I do think that's well yeah familiar. it's tricky it's it's not it's not we're not allowed i mean we're not allowed to because i said we're we're not allowed to um i teased it a little bit before the other thing i can say on it though just to to now elicit some sympathy is um this stuff is extraordinarily highly regulated uh and it will come as a shock to nobody it should come as a shock to nobody that regulators don't really like bitcoin very much so <laughs> that's that's part of why yeah it's taking a little longer than i would have hoped it's w- w- what it is we want to do is a lot simpler on paper than or it's a lot simpler in theory than uh it has turned out to be in practice but i would like to think we're getting there i i hope i do have a chance to come on and talk about that too well uh Selfishly, I'm happy it's taken you a bit longer, so we have something else to talk about rather quickly. <laughs> yes, the the, so the content can multiply. <laughs> <laughs> well, Alan, this has been a pleasure. Thank you for doing. Yeah, likewise. Being. Prolific writer, prolific thinker, like the way you frame things and really um, get people's perspective on Bitcoin to sort of shift and, and approach it from different directions. I mean, Bitcoin in Venice is just one of the books that really makes people think about Bitcoin differently. And I oh, thank you. You, recognize you, you do realize how biased it. you are in saying that though, or do you, I'm not yeah, sure. Do you yeah. know what I'm talking about? I mean, I am referencing the book. So exactly. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I, I mean, <laughs> obviously correct me if I'm wrong. I don't mean this to be in any way insulting, but I don't think any other Bitcoin book quotes you. Uh, I, there is one. There is oh, one. really? Yeah, yeah. What what, uh, what what's the quote? What are you? What did you say? Uh, I think it was like Bitcoin will change us more than we change Bitcoin, which is actually that's pretty, pretty good. I mean, obviously, I now have to unless you remember it and you want to say the quote from Bitcoin is Venice, which I think is better. To be completely honest, do you remember um, it? Yeah, turn off wet ass pussy and put on a Bitcoin podcast. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Stop listening to WAP out there. Come over. We got to fix the culture. Yes. I endorse we, we, this we message. Bitcoin. <laughs> <laughs> Bitcoin fixes this. That's actually yes. a good thing to end on. That's <laughs> essentially the, the conclusion of, of capital in the 21st century. Is Bitcoin yeah. Bitcoin, fix Bitcoin fixes the cost of the capital uh, at the very least. Hopefully, hopefully a lot more than that. Yeah. Oh. I'm excited. Uh, to see Axiom um, more people become aware of what you guys have been doing on the venture side and then eventually when all that tape is gotten through oh, what you guys have planned um, from that side of the business and just keep fighting man we're, uh, we're going to win we are winning I think we're winning I think, I think so uh, even though the regulators hate us I think we do have a uh, truth on our side and undeniable truth in terms of increased utility and productivity and value accrual for humanity in Bitcoin and the industries going around it. Very much agreed. All right. Alan, go enjoy your weekend. 
it must be like happy hour where you are. Oh yeah, it is uh, right. Yeah. I to be fair, I I have a I have a wedding tomorrow. I don't want to get too wasted right now. (laughs) Well, enjoy the wedding. Enjoy your weekend. That's all we got today, freaks. Peace and love.